Hey, this is Dave Meltzer here live at the Wynn Las Vegas in the lobby at Blue Wire Studios. And I have another Chevy Chase on my hands. I call that because there's very few people I've had on the playbook more than once. But this is one of my favorite people in the world because we share the same perspective. And the perspective Forrest Griffin and I have is what I call rule number six. It's don't take yourself so seriously. And you are someone from the time I met you you know, I was so excited to meet you. You're a legend of USC. And I'm thinking, okay, you know, I've met with all the fighters. This guy's going to be tough to talk to. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, my God, he's an idiot like I am. This is perfect. And he admits it. It even makes it better. Welcome to the playbook, my friend. I love it. I love it. Thanks for having me back. Um, yeah, I mean, should we just, I feel like the first time we talked, it was pretty good. Should we just play that? We'll just insert that now? Yeah. We, that first done. interview? Let's go. Pretty good. We don't even need to do coffee. this. Yeah, yeah, well, I know you're a big coffee guy. Yeah, let's we'll, go get a coffee and just replay it and use this really fancy studio to pretend as if we talk to each other. Um, but, you know, you're here in Las Vegas at the UFC Performance Center and... Institute. But Institute. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So yeah. It's funny. Performance Center was actually the idea that, that like, my suggestion for the title. <laughs> but it turns out that that is the WWE down in Florida. Their training center is called the Performance Center. So oh. Institute it is. And Institute's where you keep crazy people. And you got to be a little <laughs> bit crazy to fight somebody for money in a cage. So it works out. That is a little bit crazy. But as much as it is crazy, it's highly advanced in technology uh, and all aspects. The mindset, the heart set, and then the physicality of different equipment. You know, I've been there, but describe to people the different nuances of equipment that is used today, you know, from, you know, even the mindset stuff, but also just understanding how acceleration and power and strength work within the context of fighting. Yeah, I mean, obviously we have, you know, force plates, diameters, uh, you know, er everything you could imagine. Basically, um, what we're trying to do, and we're still doing it every day, is figure out what, what are the physical needs, um, cardiovascularly, strength, endurance, whatever. What are the needs you need for the sport? And then how do we train those needs best? So like one of those we've found is rate of force development. Um, you know, maximal strength is important, but the ability to tap into that strength before your opponent is actually more important than your maximum strength, right? So yeah, I mean, they've, uh, you know, all the test, testing technology you can imagine and they're bringing on like a force frame now, and that's something that you can do a lot of neck testing with and just uh, the strength of the neck and how that's related to injury and injury resilience. And, you know, again, so they're always looking for uh, new ways, new new things to add to the arsenal and, and then reevaluating, is this test we're doing effective? Should we change it? So they used to do a, a drop test, basically where you jump off of an X amount of box and now they just do the rapid, you know, the five, the five of the pogo test, I yeah. call it. Yeah. And, you know, I'll take quarterbacks, for example, because my background's more in the NFL and baseball, traditional stick and ball sports, as they call them. Uh, we've always looked at skills, knowledge, and desire uh, when we're looking at talent. And we always said that the skills and the knowledge, and I make this applicable to business people as well, skills and knowledge determine your basement. You know, some guys just naturally have extraordinary skills and knowledge. Uh, in their sport or in their business, but the desire is what creates your ceiling or your potential. How are skills, knowledge, and desire, uh, you know, represented or you know, related to each other in fighting? You know, and you know that as a fighter and as someone who has helped so many fighters. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I would I break it down. You know, we break it into your physiological capabilities and your technical capabilities. How how familiar are you with the sport? How uh, what kind of ring generalship do you have? How How is your game plan and your strategy? How is your ability to adapt and change your strategy in that moment? And obviously your physical uh, abilities as well as your skill set, those only work if your mind is in the right place, right? So, uh, you know, people will say it's 90% mental except for the 10% physical. I, I disagree. <laughs> it's it's 100% physical and it's 100% mental. The thing is... Uh, I think it was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Somebody said it. I forget, but um, it doesn't matter. You know, it only works with the mind, right? So your mind's really the key to unlocking the physical and technical capabilities you have. And, you know, consistency is obviously important. Well, consistency builds confidence and skill, yeah. you know? I'm glad that you said that because one of the other things that have come 
into a priority for athletes, especially at the UFC, I don't think was a priority when you started fighting, which is recovery. Yeah, I mean, we talk about recovery a ton. Um, you know, and recovery is great. I, I don't want to downplay it. It is very important, but it's important for the top 5%. You know, it's important because you are doing everything else correctly. Um, you know, <laughs> you got to do the work to recover from the work. Let's just make sure that, that, that we say that, right? Like, that is, oh, man, I was just out. Uh, Spent 40 minutes on that recovery today. Cool, that's that's good. Glad, <laughs> glad to hear it. But as long as you got the, the a reason to recover, as long as you got the work in, the lifting, the, the technical training, the drilling, whatever your uh, syllabus required for the day, as you get the work in, all right, now we can recover from the work. And, you know, they talk about soft times creating soft men, hard times create hard men, and Things. I, was, I know where you're going with that there. I was like, okay. <laughs> yeah. <All right>. Well, <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah. And women. Um, and, but more importantly, uh, looking at the times today where there's so much more protection and money, exposure, personal branding, all of these things yeah. that have evolved like they have in every sport. How has that nuance affected the fight game? Well, I, I want to, I want to kind of, so there, there's some of what you're saying, but best fighters in the world still come from the favelas of Brazil. Best best fighters in the world still come from trailer parks in Georgia. Um, they're not that soft. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and that's something Dana talks about when he talks about Mexico and Mexican fighters. Is there's there's uh, an implied toughness due to the conditions, whatever they may be, that that you kind of grew up through, that lend themselves to the fighting sports. You know, to to sports where you're you know, actually fighting and there is the risk of, of, you know, danger. So I wouldn't say we've gotten too soft. Yeah. Again, you got to make it through the amateurs, through the, the middling of the, the professional uh, fight organizations before you get to the UFC. So, right. So, so by that point, hopefully you've paid your dues and you've developed that mental toughness through your training. Um, again, this still isn't football or basketball where these kids are found at 13, 14. I heard some kid who's like 12 <laughs> find a football scholarship like in for the Premier League yeah. or some craziness. Look, this is still, you know, MMA, right? So you still you still had to grind it out, train it in your garage. I was talking to a kid on Instagram. He's asking me, he's a fighter, you know, he's like five and one. He's asking me what to do. And he's, you know, changing his, he trains in his garage currently, right? You know, and, and he, he has a full-time job, and he fights full-time. So um, there, there's, there's still a lot of toughness out there. You know, you're not, we're not recruiting these kids at 15 saying, oh, man, you're really good. We're going we're gonna to give you a scholarship now and let you go, you know. so. And, and there's a bunch of celebrity uh, utilization in fighting, boxing, UFC, MMA. Um, and some of these celebrities, you know, really are just looking for the awareness and – you know, do you think that discredits the sport? Should we give them attention, intention? What, what should we do with these celebrity fighters that, you know, just want to pay day on pay-per-view because they have a huge following? I mean, yeah, I mean, I, I have no idea. I mean, I, <laughs> again, I'm a fan of the sport. I, I come from a different background. I see the work that the people have done, the, the champions, the up-and-comers, and that's where I put my time and attention. So if I have a voice, I use it to, you know, support those people that are coming up. You know, the, uh, you know, young Mexican fighter like the Brandon Moreno, the yeah. Davison Figueredos, you know, the guys I'm excited to fight, you know. Um, and, and then, you know, it, it's also cool people like Holly Berry get into the sport. You know, she did the movie. She trained for like over two years. Uh, you know, that's pretty cool. That kind of celebrity, like bringing yeah. some, you know. Kind of like when Brock Lesnar fought in the UFC, it brought a lot of you know celebrity and notoriety to it. That's always a good thing, you know. You in any sport business where you're trying to entertain people, you want to get in as front of as many eyes as possible. So it's a good thing for that. What? Why do you think so many people resonate with the UFC? You know, it was the fastest growing sport, multi billion dollar entity, which is continually to grow. And there's been a lot of similar, yeah. similar sports around for years and years. Why do you think this is the, the one that resonates so well? Well, the, the UFC has done fighting the best, obviously, you know. 
Um, and think about fighting. What is fighting? Fighting is the epitome of competition between two human beings. Um, you, we're watching, I was watching the basketball highlights, the football highlights. Those are great, but when those guys get serious, they quit trying to put a ball through a hoop for some arbitrary rules or like you can pat, like you can throw overhand this time, but underhand this time. That's stupid. <laughs> Why don't we just like, hey, you guys are about the same size. Who would win in a fight? Who can make the other person say, I quit, no mask? That's the epitome of human competition. When there's a fight and it happens, that's on Sports Center. People watch the fight. You know, I remember like watching basketball fights growing up. Seems like there's not as many. Maybe I just don't watch Sports Center enough anymore. But it used to be like fights. You know, people fighting, and you know, you see like 80 inch reaches throwing hammers at each other. It's like, oh, that was cool. That's, I mean, that that is to me more interesting than an arbitrary rule set. Like, all right, we're gonna kick it here. But then we can touch with our hands here. But then, like, what? <laughs> or or get, well, think about how weird. All right, so there's a ball. We have to get it through a hoop. But you can only take two or three steps, depending on the ref. <laughs> and then you have to bounce it off the ground. <laughs> what? Why would, we, why would we bounce a ball if that makes no sense to me? It's like, just, uh, like what? It depends on who, who you are, right? Michael Jordan always got an extra step. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, I, <laughs> hey, I watched I watch today, you know, I was a huge basketball fan in the 90s, and it's not even the same game. No, although I will give credit to <clears throat> NBA stars uh, for being incredible athletes. Oh, it's, it's, that is one of the most uh, – and those guys I've gotten – been very fortunate to train quite a few of them in the MMA – that is, to me, the epitome of athleticism because the size, the strength, the speed, and the coordination is there. The ability to, like I'm saying, like bounce this ball, put it between your legs, put it between the other guy. Do, you know, that, that is one of the sports that impresses me the most. You know, I know uh, we're both from Ohio, originally born there, and LeBron James, to me, you know, Bo Jackson, LeBron James, watching the athleticism uh, of what they do and can do, you know, for fighting – as a game, you know, there's a lot. Yeah, LeBron, I mean, he messed up. He could have been a really good fighter. A great fighter. He could have been a world <laughs> champion, you know. Oh, wow. Well. That's amazing. What qualities, though, you know, that, you know, the general public probably uh, may not know since you've been in the game so long, you know, is it this combination of mental toughness with speed, fast switch muscles, power? Yeah, like, yeah. What, what, what are the, the nuances? I'll make, I'll make it simpler. So yeah. those are, yeah, those are all. Those are all necessity, but um, it's decision making under pressure. So if you think about like why do we spar? Why do we pre pretend fight each other at seventy or eighty percent? We do that to improve our ability to come to a decision point and then pick the correct path quickest. And that's a lot of times what wins the day is who can react and act and then react and make better decisions in the fight than their opponent, especially at the highest level. Yeah. You know, it, it really is about your ability to take in information and make a decision in a split second, almost instinctively without realizing you're doing it. If you ask the best in the world how they do it, they, they couldn't tell you. I'm, I'm sure you're familiar, right? Like, oh, Absolutely. Uh, there's, a, there's a famous, I was reading a sports psychology book, and there's a famous quote by Kobe, and it's like, don't, don't ask me how I do it, just know that I'm going to do it. You know? no, I love that. And, and that's that's you've you've put yourself in that position a thousand times. So when you're in that position in front of a million people, four million bucks, boom, the correct answer is what falls out of your body. So if I'm hearing you correctly, the conditioning, the strength and speed, when you get to the highest level, everyone has enough conditioning, strength and speed. It's really picking the right and making the right decision in that reaction that creates the winner. Yeah, I, I don't want to discount the strength, the speed, and the physical. And, and are some is there like a fighter that's a LeBron James that just is a a, a specimen that just has much more strength, speed, and power? <laughs> yeah, I mean there there there's there's physical specimens like uh, Francis Ngannou fighting in a couple weeks here. But back to your your first question, yeah. the physical stuff all has to be there, mm -hmm. right? But but again, we started this this with the physical stuff plus the mental stuff. That physical stuff, if you cannot access it in that instant when you need it the most, then it doesn't matter. So everybody at this point's got conditioning. Like, you remember when I used to fight? Yeah. There's about 30 or 40% of the time when I fought, somebody would just run out of gas. People don't run out of gas that much, and they fight at a yeah. higher pace 
because one, they know what to expect, and two, they they've prioritized that conditioning and they know how to prioritize that conditioning. And nutrition, that, yeah, like, nutrition, yeah. That, you know, sp- recovery. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the sports performance weight institute making, has yeah. ridiculous technologies. Once it <clears throat> comes to that, um, it, to that though, is the la- last question. Uh, there's a lot more going on with the mindset side besides the Cleveland Clinic and protecting the mind. Yeah. But there's a lot of psychology preparation. Uh, how much is technology based now that you can use visualization, AR, VR, or other tools, or is it strictly sparring and, and other mindset stuff? So yeah, that's a great question. And one of the things we examined a couple of years ago, and I'd still like to bring into uh, you know existence at some point, is uh, the ability to do sparring in VR. Now it's not. I don't know if you've ever played any of the games. I like them. I think they're a good workout. But it's really your ability to react. So you're going to move. You're going to slip. You're going to move. You're going to defend strikes correctly as a way to warm up before your actual sparring or as a way to keep your reflexes, your, your, your game speed dialed in without actually having to spar and risk injury, right? Because sparring, it's super important it's one of the most important things you can do but every time you do it there's the risk of some physical injury you know it's interesting because i studied goddard and the idea of the subconscious feeling the emotional side of understanding and being able to perform through the feeling of the subconscious and one of the things i love about vr and ar and there's companies like black box vr that actually has now instituted like at the fitness centers these you know virtual because it's combined with a, a universal machine to make it more competitive that you, you know, go through a 30 minute workout like this because you feel like you're in a game. Yeah. Uh, but there's, you know, definitely a benefit to f- the f- being able to feel it and not physically have to do it. And the body remembers how we feel much greater than it does the conscious realm. Are there any emotional things that you see right now that that fighters are doing or that you'd like to institute at the institute well no i mean like it's like i was telling you we we have a sports psychology department and that's more their realm as as far as emotions everybody's got that the cueing the what gets them hyped up what they tap into you see people with pictures of their families you see people with whatever you know everybody has uh you know their what motivates them, you know, and I, I don't want to speak to that too much. I'm not an expert in that field. I simply give the referrals out. Hey, you should talk to this guy. <laughs> yeah. But for me, um, you know, it, it's meant to be fun, man. I'm trying to have fun out here. I'm not worried about my family. I'm not worried about, I mean, all those things are real. This is my family's future. This is my livelihood. And that's important. But to an extent, this is also something I got into because I thought that's a cool way that's something cool you know and and a lot of guys in my era and still now with with amateur they do it for free with the maybe I'll make money off this maybe I won't so remember that there's still some fun to it and even if it is fighting which is the most serious sport there is it's still a sport and you you can still have fun doing it you don't need to make it the uh, live or die life and death you know end of the world there's just so much more to you than people see the way that you tied this interview all the way back to rule number six, not taking ourselves so seriously and having fun. It ties into exactly what the playbook is about teaching people to do their best, learn lessons well, and have, you fun. know, po- positive, uh, positive reinforcement always serves better than negative. I read it in a book. Your I hope it was mine. Thank you so much. What an incredible playbook. One of my dear friends, an incredible, uh, legend himself, Forrest Griffin, Vice President of the Athlete Development for the UFC Performance Institute and the UFC in general. Thank you. I hope I got that right, my friend. Thanks for joining me here.